Listening to audiobooks brings us closer together, and there's no better place to listen than Audible. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet, and now Audible members get even more. Exclusive audio fitness programs, audiobooks, and Audible originals with custom-made content. Start a 30-day trial, and your first audiobook is free. Go to audible.com slash unerased or text unerased to 500-500. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash unerased or text unerased to 500-500. You can do it with audiobooks. Away offers high-quality luggage in a variety of colors and four sizes designed to be resilient, resourceful, and essential to the way you travel. Away luggage features a TSA-approved combination lock, four 360-degree spinner wheels, and a patent-pending compression system to help overpackers. Not to mention the carry-on sizes are compliant with all major U.S. airlines. For $20 off a suitcase, visit awaytravel.com slash unerased and use promo code UNERASED during checkout. This is Unerased, a podcast series about the hidden history of conversion therapy in America. I'm Chad Abumrad. I think I heard a bunch of pings. Is that other people joining us? I'm here. I'm Sandy, too. Hi. Hi, Sandy. Um, I th- hope Hi. On when, hope, if I wind up hanging up on everybody, I'll call right back, but I think someone else is calling in. Hold on. One of the things that's been really stark about this series for me is seeing the distance that people sometimes travel. Like at a certain point, you think you know who you are, what you believe, but then some new reality smacks into you, turns your world upside down, and suddenly those old beliefs don't make sense anymore. She's having to take, why don't you take a little break for a minute? She's having to take a break. Okay, cool. She had to answer another call. And at that point, you've got a choice to either dig in or to accept that your world is different now and that you've got to be different. Yes, Hi, guys. It's Kat. I'm back. That was, um, that was our Oklahoma City crew joining, joining the call. Today, a story about a group of women who are all super-powered case studies in this ability to span universes. And the story comes from producer Kat Aaron. Um, to start, can you just tell me your name and and who you are. Hello, I'm Liz Dyer, I'm the founder and owner of Serendipity Duda for Moms. So Liz's story begins about 10 years ago. She and her family, they're living just outside of Dallas. It's her, her husband, their two sons. They're all very active in their local church. I led women's ministry for many years. Uh, we volunteered for everything. We went to every service that they had. Our friendships, our social life was all wrapped up in our church life. And in fact, her oldest son. He was um, going to college at Abilene Christian University to be in full-time ministry. Was studying to be a minister. And um, and one day in 2006, it's his freshman year, he calls her up and he's excited because this group is coming to campus. Let me see. Um, have you ever heard of a um, organization called Soul Force? No. Okay. It was started by a man named Mel White. There are hundreds of thousands of mental and physical health workers in this country who are on record as saying, this is not a sickness. This is just a variation on creation. This is just Mel White is a clergyman and an author who worked with people like Jerry Falwell, Billy Graham, Pat Robertson. And uh, he started this organization called Soul Force, and they go around to Christian college campuses to let gay Christians know that um, God loves you. You can be a Christian and you can be gay. Most Christian college campuses won't let them on campus, so they'll just be on the outskirts. So that day on the phone, her son was really excited because this time Abilene College was going to let Soul Force onto campus. He was on the welcome committee. And she was like, why why are you so excited? I was um, a conservative evangelical Christian woman who believed that anyone who was homosexual, could only be whole and healthy if they either became heterosexual or lived a life of celibacy. I also feared that my son was gay. And so eventually she just asks him, are you? And I remember he had said to me, um, if I was gay, it would really upset you, wouldn't it? So he was measuring. He was measuring, yes. 
And that fall, she asks again. And he tells her outright, yes, mom, I'm gay. How did it strike you? I was angry. I felt like at the initial um, feeling is, oh, my gosh. I mean, we've all been living a lie. I don't know my son. I don't know who he is. He's hidden this from me. How have I failed? You know, how has my husband failed? How has our family failed? I mean, just so many, many, many emotions. Um, She says it was a short conversation. He was disappointed in my response. That hurt him. I was disappointed in what he told me. I felt hurt. There was tears on from both of us. I mean, we didn't stay on the phone. We didn't reconcile anything in that moment. Over the next few months, Liz says his grades dropped. We had limited means. Um, we had always said, if you don't do well, we can't keep you at that school. We were paying full tuition, and private Christian schools are not inexpensive. So we said... With everything going on, you're not doing well, come home. But we also said we really think you might want to consider changing your major and and what you're going to do because this would be a huge obstacle to go into full-time ministry and be an open gay person. So they pulled him out of college. He was angry because he had to come home. So when he came home that year at Christmas, uh, the next few months were pretty rough. Uh, We had lots of kind of loud conversations. Um, She says at one point she threatened to disown him. um, I mean, really, I'm telling you, the experience really humbled me. I mean, I stepped down from every leadership position I had in the church almost immediately. Wow. Uh, I just felt very disconcerted about what I believed and why, and, and I just felt like I can't teach, I can't lead if I don't know what I believe. I didn't tell people at first while I was stepping down. I just said, I have something personal that I need to deal with. My husband and I, we kind of, we realized we're going to have to hide this, what we're going through. And so we just decided we're not going to go to church for a while. But we need to figure this out. So she started doing some research. I'm a researcher at heart. Now, I had never really researched this subject much, even though in the back of my mind, I think there had always been a question for many years whether my son was gay. Was your first stop on this sort of research journey to go to the Bible itself? Yes. What gave you that idea? Was it your son prompting you? Yes, my son challenged me. Go and see what the Bible really says. If, if that's what's, you know, kind of getting in the way here, look for yourself. We don't really have many clues into how the Bible thought about things. You have to pull it out kind of verse by verse. Sister Carol Perry is a nun. A member of the Society of St. Ursula of Tours. So we met Sister Carol in the last episode. She was talking about the story of Job with Garrett Conley. And she's not just a Roman Catholic sister. Sister Carol is a Bible scholar, and she kind of finagled her way into this elite theology program in Rome in the 1950s in a time when very, very few women were getting that kind of education. That's where I really met the Bible and fell in love with it. We had dogmatic theology, moral theology, missiology, spiritual theology, archaeology. You name the ologies, I have been there. That time in Rome, that was where Sister Carol started to really parse the Bible itself. Not the ideas, but the text. And so I was in my mid-20s. And for me, it was like, the wow, where has this been all my life? So the more I studied the Bible, the more I realized that there were human authors working with God's inspiration. These authors, their people spread over thousands of years, speaking different languages that come from different cultures. I realized how little I knew and how much there was to know. In any case, after Rome, Sister Carol came up against the same question that Liz would grapple with. It's the early 1990s, and Sister Carol is working in a church in New York City, and there was a debate underway. The minister is a guy named Arthur Caliandro, and he knew that some people in his congregation were gay, and he kind of had to decide, what do I do? Do I openly recognize them or not? And Dr. Caliandro told me, and I am directly referring to him, he's now gone to God in heaven, that he consulted every major Protestant minister in New York City. And every one of them gave him the same answer. 
Do not touch that issue with a 10-foot pole. You will destroy your church congregation. In the middle of this debate, Sister Carol Perry was asked one day, as a Bible scholar, how should the church think about homosexuality? I mean, I will not tell you how many hours of research went into that talk because I felt I had to be honest, but I had to be truthful, and it had to be based on fact. What does the Bible say? Not what do I want it to say. It's a profound issue. And so she, like Liz, went back to the text. There's a famous saying that, you know, reading, reading the text of the Bible in a different language is like kissing your bride through the veil. That's Ozzy Schwartz. He's a cantor at the Park Avenue Synagogue, and he chanted the passages for us. The passages that both Carol Perry and Liz Dyer zoomed in on are the ones that sometimes get called the clobber passages. And they're called that because those verses are often used to clobber gay people over the head with their sins. There's about seven of them spread across the different books of the Bible. And one of the first that Carol Perry went to... All right, well, the Sodom and Gomorrah story is in the book of Genesis. And it is the story of two strangers who come to town. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening. The strangers are actually angels sent by God. And Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, who is a God-man, invites them into his home. So Lot lives in Sodom. And the story goes, we never really understand why. But all the people in this town, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, once they find out that Lot has these two house guests, they surround his house. And they call to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? They come and knock, practically knock down Lot's front door, and they say, give those men to us. Specifically, the language right there, it's been interpreted to mean, give those men to us, so that we can rape them. They wanted to have sex with those strangers. And Lot refuses. Lot went out to the man at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. As the story goes, God is apparently so disgusted by how the townspeople are behaving that after they leave, he tells Lot, Leave town right now. Take your daughters, take everybody, and go because this town is going to be destroyed. And sure enough, God then smites the town, wipes it off the map. And so the basic lesson here seems to be the people of Sodom are barbaric gay rapists and God hates gay people. However, it's you can't prove it. He says, you know, we're dealing with ancient Hebrew. According to Sister Carol Perry, if you actually read the specific line where the townspeople threaten to rape the angels, all it says is, Give the men to us. Bring them out to us. That we may know them. No is the word venedea from the root yada. But what does that mean? What does it mean so that we may know them? What kind of knowing are we talking about? In biblical uh, literature, that uh, root stands not only for to get to know someone, but to have um, a sexual relationship with someone. But Carol Perry says, I don't know. They use the very same language, yes, for marriage. Yes, they use it for sex, but they also can use it in the sense of give me a book. I mean, it's it, you, can't, you can't look at it, that text and just take that English word and say that's what they were going to do. I think that there is really... Almost no question that the like original phrasing is overtly sexual. That's Joel Baden. He's a professor of Hebrew Bible at Yale Divinity School. He disagrees. Everybody who heard that would have known what it meant. I mean, that comes up as a phrase so often in the Bible that we can say things like, you know, know him in, or know her in the biblical sense. There is a question, though, as to whether or not the issue of homosexuality is in fact what's sort of at stake in the story of Sodom at all. I mean, we have come to call it sodomy and call people like that sodomites, but I think it's almost equally clear that 
homosexuality is not the central driving issue of the story of Sodom. It's a story about hospitality. Joel says that is the main point that the story of Sodom is trying to make. It's not that gay sex is bad. It's that not welcoming people in need is bad. They didn't help the poor and the needy. That was the town's real sin. What they were was jerks, not gay. And one of the, I mean, another reason to think that is is, is certainly because this, there's lots of references to Sodom and Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible, and there's not a single one of them that makes any allusion to homosexuality. That's an entirely post-biblical uh, spin. In fact, Ezekiel, you know, is condemning Israel and says, your sin is worse than Sodom's sin. And what was Sodom's sin? Arrogance. So, I mean, there's, you know, given the opportunity to say, what's the sin of Sodom? It's not homosexuality, and it never is. So the issue of sexuality in the homosexual sense of the word never appears in any of the Gospels. It just was not an issue for Jesus Christ. Now, if you really want to find something, you could go back before Jesus, like 12 centuries before, to the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. It's a book of laws. A list of thou shalt nots. You know, when you have insomnia, read the driver's manual. Leviticus 18.22 goes something like, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Fairly clear cut. The verse clearly outlaws two men having anal sex. Like, just, that's what it says. But, on the page before, the human being is also told not to have tattoos, not to wear clothing made of more than one kind of fabric. It also says avoid eating turtles and mole rats. There's like this whole collection of crazy stuff that nobody today is following, really. Joel says if you look at it historically, those passages in Leviticus were written by just one priest. One guy! You know, the same author who says don't have gay, uh, don't have gay sex is the same author who says go ahead and treat your slaves as bad as you want. So, like, mm. So you can't take every verse of the Bible with the same weight. So Sister Carol in New York and Liz Dyer in Texas, they look at the same verses many years apart, and they come to very similar conclusions. There really was not sufficient evidence in Scripture to condemn same-sex relationship. Liz says as soon as she realized that, something in her began to shift. Okay, well, it's not black and white. And I know my kid, right? That's a powerful combination. It's 2007. And the internet is just exploding. Blogging is a big thing. Everybody has a blog. So Liz decides, I'm going to start a blog of my own. Share her story, put it out in the world. But what happens, she says, is that within months, she started getting these emails from women all over the country. She turns the blog into a Facebook group. And at first, there's just a few dozen members. And then there's a couple hundred. And then over the years, it turned into a few thousand. And they start to call themselves the Mama Bears. And this brings me back to that conference call. I mean, he, he almost, he... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Something happened. Which was so hard to organize. On the call, we had five women from all different corners of the country. I'll go ahead while she's reconnecting if you want me Great. to. Sure, please. Uh, Kimberly Shapley, S-H-A-P-P-L-E-Y. Kimberly lives in Austin, Texas, and she joined the group in 2017. It, it took me forever to even get in the mom group because I was so far right, right ultra conservative tea partier that trying to get vetted and approved to get in the mom group was hard because they all thought I was a <laughs> troll. You have to understand, like, I was radically far right. Very. Yeah, we, we took a vote. We were going to kick you out, but we didn't. Yeah, right? <laughs> no, we didn't. That's a lie. But... <laughs> I would get in the group and I would just scroll through the news feed of all the things that were posted by the other moms. And it was so hard for me. Like Kim says so she used to post screeds against liberals, against gays, against the ACLU. And like Liz, before joining the group. I was in ministry at uh, Lakewood Church, Joel Osteen Ministries, for many years. I led mom ministry and Bible study and prayer team ministries. And but then her world changed when her two-year-old toddler, a two-year-old she thought was a son, started wanting to only wear girls' clothes, 
only play with baby dolls. And conversion therapy didn't work on a toddler. By three and a half, Kai was saying, I am a girl. And it just so happened that that year... This action is about a great deal more than bathrooms. This is about the dignity and the respect that we accord our fellow citizens. The Obama administration put out new guidelines on bathrooms for transgender students, which, as we all know... We will mobilize and strategize to prepare for a, for a national movement for decency. ...caused a backlash. This is not a Republican or a Democrat thing. Amen. This is not a Christian or an atheist thing. This is a family protection thing. This is Brad Dubose of a church called the Central Assembly of God in Angleton, Texas, just south of where Kim and Kai were living. We must protect our sons and our daughters from the militant homosexual agenda. We want to tell them loudly, but lovingly, but very plainly, you cannot have our children. Amen. And we will fight to protect them with everything that is in our hearts. The state of Texas filed suit against the administration, insisting, as they would put it, that men's bathrooms are for men, males assigned male at birth, that is, and female bathrooms are for women. And Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick said, you know what, if the Obama administration won't give us any more money unless we change the bathrooms. Well, in Texas, he can keep his 30 pieces of silver. We will not yield to blackmail from the president of the United States. So Kimberly addressed her local school board. I would love to bring my child to your house. I would love for you to come to my house. I would like for you to see my child. And if you still think that my daughter doesn't need to use the girl's restroom, I at least will know that you've met her. And that... The mother of a transgender student was here asking board members to consider changing that policy. Turned into a local news story. And as that story spread, Kimberly says, one by one, My mother doesn't speak to me. I've lost my siblings. I've lost my aunts, uncles, cousins, my best friends. She basically lost everyone. The media, especially, you know, Facebook and Twitter, they were horrible to us, the things that they were saying. And I let the moms know, like, wow, I don't know how to handle this. I've never been attacked like this before. And... Literally, the moms activated, and I they just jumped in, and they were defending us, and they were just they were very active in shutting it down. And it was really nice for me, um, having just lost all of my family, my church, my friends. It's really nice when you have this huge group of women who you've never even met before, but they have the same heart. And they just get in and they defend you and they stand in the gap for you. And they get in there and they get messy and they stay up all night online just to make sure that you're okay. I made a comment on there that, you know, that my sisters had disowned me and I literally had no family left. And moms in the group actually went onto my Facebook page and listed me as their sister. That may not seem important to just anybody, but in my shoes, it was a really big deal. A really big deal. We need a safe word. <laughs> Seriously. Shit, son of a bitch. You're going to cut that out. <laughs> sorry. We may love Jesus, but we cuss a little. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Okay. Exactly. 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 Sarah, okay. can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your situation? Okay, um, well, um, we live in Oklahoma City, born and raised, and we have two children, our youngest of which is gay. When he turned 21, he said, Mom, I met someone, and I really need you to be okay about it. And that was a turning point. Uh, we thought we were the only family uh, with a gay kid in Oklahoma. <laughs> I didn't know where to look for resources. I do remember uh, searching the matter out online. She says she considered conversion therapy for a second. But then she found the mama bears. And there were 250 moms in it at that time. And uh, what shocked me the most is that we all had the same story. I remember one of the first days in that group, a mom came on and she said, I just heard the words, you know, mom, I'm gay. And I don't even know how to breathe. I don't even know how to pray anymore. And all the moms rushed to that thread and said, then you don't. You let us breathe and you let us pray for you. And what I love about the group also is that it helps us find our voice. Mm-hmm. And Sandy, can you introduce yourself a little bit and sort of talk 
talk Hi. about how you how yeah. you came to the group? Yeah. Um, so I'm Sandy Van Dyne, V A N D Y N E, two words. Um, and from California, we lived um, until recently in a very conservative part of California in the high desert. Sandy has three daughters, all raised in Christian schools, and the youngest one came out to her when she was a teenager. I went through different things online. I felt very, very alone. And then when I found the moms, it was like, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. That was life changing. And um, it's, it's just a truly anointed space. Mm -hmm. Who's that mm -hmm mm-hmm? We're all, uh, we're all <laughs> saying, uh-huh, amen, I yes. said amen, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> it occurred to me on that call that what I was participating in was something like a phone congregation. These women, who are scattered all across the country, most of them have lost their church. And this was them remaking that church. Um, I just experienced God and the power of the Holy Spirit and to a... Um, to, it, to a much greater degree than I even thought possible. All of them told me some version of this, that this is the place where they feel most religious because of how much they have changed in this process. I remember the first time I saw that, like the leather community on a float going down Pride. You know, three years ago, that would have offended me. Uh, there was a time where I thought, well, I'll go and have a prayer circle on 39th Street and see if I can change, you know, save these people. And I stood at the pride parade and I about fell to my knees with a brick in my throat because I realized the audacity of that prayer. And it just, it just makes me tremble when I think about where I was. And I mean, there's a mom out there like me then who needs a mom like me now. Just to jump in for a second, uh, it turns out that that thing that uh, Sarah just said about moms in need finding each other we sort of witnessed firsthand that that is happening right now a lot, like a lot, a lot. And your phone is right next to me as you're going and messages keep popping up. There's so many messages. Oh, my God. I know. It's, God. it's constant. It is. That's and just. My, that's why I say my email is my monster. A few weeks ago, uh, as Kat was working on the story, uh, producer Shima Oliai and I happened to be in Dallas and we, we got to meet up with Liz. And we actually had to stop the interview because her phone was just blowing up with messages from the group. Jesus, you, that's, that's got to be 50 messages just in the time we've been talking. It's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. And we These days, the group is up to roughly 3,700 members. Last week, I think we added 83 moms to the group. So we're adding hundreds of moms per month right now. Wow, it's 83 exclusive. just last week. Yeah. Is it just Christians or is it... No, it's not just Christians, um, but it is a lot of Christians. Liz showed us a little bit of what happens in the group. There's a lot of sharing of pictures, swapping of jokes, asking of questions like, hey, my transgender kid says they want this thing called a packer. What is a packer? Where do I get that? So a packer is a thing that trans men might use to put in their pants to recreate the bulge. There you go. Um, but what is interesting about watching Liz click uh, through the Mama Bears Facebook group is that as you scroll down the page, what you notice is that every so often you will see these bat calls for help. Oh, this one's interesting. Let me tell you a little bit about this. Uh, dear Mama Bears, there's a young 21-year-old gay man in Orange County, California, in desperate need of some Mama Bear love and attention. And the young man is from a Muslim family who recently moved to the U.S., uh, if you take on being his mama bear, it would be very important that you hold respect for and interest in both his religion and country of origin. Did uh, I saw some replies to that. Did uh, mama bear step up? Well, that was only posted uh, about a week ago. Um, one mom says, I have a friend that's Muslim who might be a good resource. And then she says, that'd be great. Um, let me clarify, he's not looking for a Muslim mama bear, but I wanted to make sure whoever reached out to him would not carry bias. And then a woman says, I'm 100% Lebanese. I'd be willing to be a mama bear from afar. One says, I'm in Orange County. I'm not sure if I'd be the best fit overall, but I'm here to lend a hand. And then a lot of this stuff uh, gets taken offline. It starts to become very personal. Yeah, I understand. Um, Coming up, things do get personal and uh, very offline. 
Th- thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, thanks, um, Sandy and Kimberly oh, um, and Sarah for getting on today. Okay. Can everyone take a selfie of like where they're at with the sound guy? And did we talk about that? Everyone take a selfie or have a picture and Liz, you could post it in the group or something on that thread. That'll be fun. Great, great idea, Sarah. We will do that. And Kat will send me a picture of her too. And we'll we'll put them all out there. (laughs) Yes. Perfect. All right. I love you girls. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 I'm Chad Abumrad. Unerased will continue after the break. Simple Contacts is the most convenient way to renew your contact lens prescription and reorder your brand of contacts from anywhere in minutes. To renew your prescription with Simple Contacts, all you need is your current contacts, an internet connection, and 10 feet of space. The doctor's office is now wherever you are. After you take the five-minute Simple Contacts vision test online, it'll be reviewed by a licensed doctor and you'll receive a renewed prescription to reorder your contacts. No more appointments, no more waiting rooms, no more overpaying. Simple Contacts has all the brands and types of lenses you're familiar with, so you never have to shop around to find your lenses at the best price. The vision test is only 20 bucks, and standard shipping is free. This isn't a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam. You still need those occasionally. But it is the most convenient way to renew a prescription and reorder your contacts if your vision hasn't changed. To get 20 bucks off your first order of contacts, go to simplecontacts.com slash unerased or enter unerased at checkout. That's simplecontacts slash unerased or enter unerased at checkout for 20 bucks off your first order. As your family is getting back into the swing of school schedules, let HelloFresh take the guesswork out of meals week after week. With three plans to choose from, classic, veggie, and family, HelloFresh's meal kits make dinner easy, even amidst the after-school chaos. No more having to plan, spend money on takeout, or worry about gathering ingredients. Not to mention, the easy-to-follow recipes and pre-measured ingredients are all delivered right to your door in recyclable, insulated packaging, which comes in handy on those hectic school nights when your to-do list is a mile long or you're busy chauffeuring the kids to practices and study groups. There's even a one-pot recipes for maximum flavor with minimal cleanup. So you can get that time back to do more of what you love. I love HelloFresh personally because it makes my Sunday meal prep process so much easier. Instead of spending hours at the grocery store figuring out what I need for a recipe and then dragging it all back home to make that recipe, all of the ingredients come to me in pre-portioned packages with a clear recipe and I'm able to make something from my home that's good for my family and it doesn't take up my entire day. For a total of $60 off, that's $20 off your first three boxes, visit HelloFresh.com slash Unerased60 and enter code Unerased60. It's like receiving six meals free when you go to HelloFresh.com slash Unerased60 and enter code Unerased60. If you enjoyed this show, check out Believed, a new podcast about the women who brought down Dr. Larry Nasser. He abused hundreds of women and girls for more than 20 years. The hosts, Kate Wells and Lindsay Smith, show you how Nasser got away from parents, police, and powerful institutions. Because once you know that, you'll understand how they missed it and how you might have missed it too. Believed, a new limited run podcast from Michigan Radio and NPR. Subscribe now at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We're back. This is Unerased. I'm Jad Ibumrod. So here's what happened. As we were wrapping up production on the series and on this piece, we got a text from Liz Dyer, uh, mama of the mama bears, who told us the mama bears had just gotten a bat call from North Carolina. Winston-Salem, North Carolina, at Tanglewood Park. From two young women there who need help. Can you introduce yourselves, your names? Um, I'm Kelsey. I'm a dog trainer. I'm Joanna Newcomer. Police officer. We are brides. <laughs> yep, we gonna get married. <laughs> I'm glad you're hitting each other while, <laughs> while you announce that you're getting married. That's great. I think that's- okay, so here's the story. 
producer Shima Oliaya takes from here. So Kelsey and Joanna, they're mid-late 20s. They met about two years ago. We met on a dating website. We went on a date. And then another date. Just kept going on more dates, movies and stuff. Dog stuff, lots of dog stuff. We love dogs. And then it got serious. And then they were faced with the age-old question, compounded in this case. How do we tell our parents? Were you guys both open with your parents about it, or...? Um, so I came out in, like, sixth grade. Um, so that was sixth grade, and in high school I came out to my parents. So. Joanna told me when she told her parents about Kelsey, they weren't thrilled, but they weren't surprised. Kelsey, on the other hand, hadn't told her parents she was gay. Her way of announcing the relationship was to post a photo of her and Joanna on our Facebook page. And when she did... Um, my mom didn't speak to me for several months. And everybody else just kind of ignored it and didn't say anything. And they all said that the reason they couldn't support me was because it was against their faith. And so she found herself in a situation where she was getting married and no one from her family would come, including her mom. What about your dad? Um, I don't know my dad. Oh, wow. So my mom was the only person that I really had, so... For not to have your mom come to your wedding is a really big deal to me because I wanted that support. Um, And that's when I I accidentally stumbled upon the video. I didn't look for it. I didn't go on Google and research it or anything. I just found it. Kelsey said she was scrolling on Facebook one day, saw this video, and clicked on it. It was actually from Sarah, the mama bear we heard from before. The video basically said, hey, if you're LGBTQ and your parents don't support you and you want to get married and you have no one to walk you down the aisle, We'll fly in and walk you down that aisle. And I messaged them. Message goes to Liz. Liz is in Texas. And Liz, she sends an APB to all the mama bears of the greater North Carolina area. So I guess there's just people in different areas that help you. So I immediately wrote back and said, yes, I'll do this. This is my stomping ground. Yeah. And then shortly after, she's like, okay, so there's two moms. Well, first of all, what are your names and what are you called? I'm Tina Rumley, and I'm a mama bear. I'm Carol Hiller, and I'm a mama bear. Both Tina and Carol live in the area, so they answer the bat call. They're both new mama bears, and I also learned that both of them had their lives turned upside down in the past year. Breaks my heart. It makes me sad, so I transfer that into a positive. Tina, you shared a little bit with me about your story. You've worked as a missionary. Can you just describe like what your life was like before your son came out? Yeah, well, in 2009, actually, we went on the mission field. and um, Where was it? In Belize. She and, and her husband had been working as missionaries there, and about a year into their stay, she gets the mom, I'm gay call from her oldest son who was attending school in the U.S. Yeah, he told me over the phone, and I was very surprised. I never saw it coming. I walked around the house crying quite a bit <laughs> when he first came out. And I really hate to say that now. I mean, you know, there's all these moms that are just like automatically on board. And man, I just so respect those moms and admire those moms. But that wasn't, that wasn't my journey. She says it took her a long, long time. It was years to be able to get to the point where I could accept his partner or um, to say he's gay. But these days? All of us are affirming except for his dad. His dad is no longer um, really in the picture. Wow. And then when did you and your husband separate? March of this year. She says basically her husband chose the church and she chose her son. You know, I knew that none of the partners that partnered with us before were going to partner with us after if, if I were a part of it. And so I, I bowed out. So now I'm currently you know, separated and job hunting. <laughs> yeah, so... I know you love your, you have a you have a group of five kids, right? Yeah, yeah, five kids, and none of them are married yet. So this is literally my first time being a mom at a wedding. So. <laughs> what kind of things have you guys been talking with her or with each other about this week in preparation for the wedding? Well, I she, we talked a lot about faith. We talked about little things like, well, have you thought about this? You know, something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. We were talking about stuff like that. You know, just things that any bride is thinking of right there before a wedding. So on the day of... Wait, so what's going on right now? I'm coming. <laughs> Kelsey's outside. She doesn't know where to go. The Mama Bears took it as their job to make sure Kelsey was everywhere she needed to be. I, I told her to tell us where she is because Mama's coming. <laughs> and to deal with the pictures. I need to flash y'all so you smile. Mom! 
And to continually remind her too to just breathe. One and a half. One, two, three. Hold it. <laughs> I've been talking to Tina Carroll uh, maybe every day since I met them. Those two ladies have kind of kept me together. Did you? Who made the cake? I made the cake. I made the cake. They check in on the cake. Um, the cake is a rich red velvet colored with sunflowers that are real on the cake. Carol and Carol Tina got King. the topper. Be okay too. Yeah, that's barefoot. The ceremony takes place in a big red refurbished barn. As guests arrive and take their seats, Tina and Carol are busy running around and stashing purses. Up there. Do you have anything that needs to go back there that you don't My want to phone. carry? Do you Fine. want me to carry it back? I'll just carry yeah. it back up there. Thank you. And help out with last minute seating arrangements. And I'm a really... And we have a latecomer. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then... They walk Kelsey down the aisle. It's not an effort for me. You know, and and I, I don't know why. I hate to say it's just because I've walked that path. Having a child that's LGBTQ, and you know, it's hard to, hard to put into words, but it's, un- it's just unconditional. When I asked Tina, what does being here, what does it do for you? You know what I mean? Like, it's doing something. She told me that it's about not being quiet. She said, for so many years... I had to be quiet. I wasn't really allowed to speak up and be bold and, and do what I'm doing right now. Wh- why? Because he wasn't affirming his dad. And so my son and I and our family, we chose to protect his dad. And in hopes, really, that his dad would come around. And he chose not to. She said she regrets all the time that she had to keep it a secret. And so... Being here for Kelsey. It's an opportunity. I think it's like saying I love you to my son. While they're doing the vows, Tina and Carol sit watching from the front of the ceremony. And they're still there later at the dinner in the big barn while the twinkly lights are on. (laughs) Hey y'all, can I have your attention for just a second? I'd like to give a toast or two, but I wanted to say, I'm sure you guys know that Kelsey can understand loving like us mama bears do. Kelsey, I fully recognize and identify with your compassionate heart. When I was talking with you this week, I was so struck by how 1 Corinthians 13 is so evident in you. Love is patient and kind. It isn't self-seeking or rude. It means more to me that strangers support us than someone that knows us because they don't have to be like that. They choose to be like that. My turn. (laughs) Raise your glasses, please. What a beautiful and realistic example of love. May you someday in the very, very distant future... They don't feel like strangers. They feel like family. They've made themselves feel like family. And thank you for letting us be part of this today. May your love for one another, those around you, see that love is love is love is love is love. And through you know that love has no limit and no gender. All right, so for the first dance as a married couple, she keeps me warm. I've made sure that the brides know that it doesn't have to be limited to today. There's other times when you just need a mama. She can always let me know then, too. I'm going to grab that sign off the door so it doesn't get forgotten. 
and cleaning. That's a good idea. It's time. Do you think we should hit the road? Yeah. I think okay. So. All right. I'm gonna get my stuff. It's back here somewhere. All right, little cub. We're leaving. We're leaving. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Bye. <laughs> Stay in touch. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Bye. Bye. Kelsey Widener and Joanna Newcomer were married on September 23rd, 2018. This episode was reported by Kat Aaron and Shima Oliai. The Unerased team is Kat, Shima, David Craig, Garrett Conley, Alice Quinlan. Our executive producer is Michael Elsesser. We had production support from Liza Yeager. Thank you to Laura Nasrallah and Robert Krolwich. Also, a very special thanks to Carrie Roberts and everybody at Anonymous Content, without whom Unerased wouldn't have been possible. Unerased is produced by Focus Features, Stitcher, and Limina House in association with the Focus film Boy Erased. I'm Jad Abumrad. I mean, it's not like um, a brutal murder during the course of an armed robbery was a routine daily event in this part of the state, right? This is something that happened very, very infrequently. Adel, Georgia, a town of roughly 5,000 people not far from the Florida state line. In 1998, there was a shocking murder there. Police investigators quickly put a man in jail for the crime. He swore he was innocent. Basically, they was going to get somebody black for killing that lady. But then, some 18 months later, a second brutal murder. And just months after that, two more. You see something savagery like that, it's, it's like, you know, who, somebody that does that is a straight psychopath. And the chance of two different people doing the same kinds of things, I mean, it just seems kind of crazy, right? I'm Jordan Smith. And I'm Liliana Segura. We're reporters for The Intercept. Together, we have more than 30 years of experience investigating wrongful convictions. We know how they happen, and how putting the wrong person in prison for murder means a killer goes free. Murderville, Georgia. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. 